and welcome to Assembly Audible. I'm your host, Jennifer Pierce. Today, I'm joined by a leading expert on cybersecurity governance programs and quality management, an NYU graduate with a master's of science in cybersecurity risk and strategy, a thought leader, cybersecurity guru, none other than Jacob Horn. Jacob, welcome to Assembly Audible. Hi Jennifer, thanks. Uh, <laughs> that's wow. That's a lot of like we were just talking about. That's a uh, that's a lot of lofty titles that I are. Know. I would like everyone to know listening. Not self-imposed. I did not make her say that. <laughs> people well, say lots of people get to, you know get expert and guru. I didn't pick those. I I do not I endorse. <laughs> um, I wondered when I was writing that. I was like, I wonder if anybody has ever called you a cybersecurity guru before. Uh. I can't remember. Uh, they, it's it always makes people the Dunning Krieger effect is very strong in the world of cybersecurity. It's always very humbling if people decide to label other folks as mm -hmm. experts and gurus mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and sources of authority. But personally, and I think a lot of people in cybersecurity, they don't like labeling themselves as experts. I would never claim to be cybersecurity is such a huge field, and there's so right. many aspects to it. And mm -hmm. the more that you learn about whatever particular discipline you're in, uh, the less confident you become in, okay. in how much you know. So thank you for the, the kind titles, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that up to other people to decide. Okay. Okay. So let's dive right into the questions. As Chief Security Evangelist with Summit 7, what does your role entail primarily? There's a couple parts to this question. Um, so I read on your LinkedIn profile, you smash compliance frameworks for fun and profit. So would you mind um, telling our listeners about your background and your current focus? Sure. So I work for a company called Summit 7 Systems, which is a Microsoft partner, and we specialize in assisting the defense industrial base, DoD contractors, and other federal contractors, specifically with compliance against NIST standards, uh, programs like CMMC, basically everything that they need to do in order to do good data governance and data protection according to federal regulations uh, along the Microsoft technology stack. So we specialize in Microsoft cloud security, migrations, configurations, and managed services. So where I come in as an evangelist is a, it's a strange title that sort of comes and goes over the years in the technology world. But effectively, it is a hybrid position where it is a little bit of management consulting, it's a little bit of content marketing, and it's a lot of sort of education and outreach. My primary mission is to build brand affinity for Summit 7 because we got to keep the lights on. But I do that by instead of pitching the way marketing might normally do, which tends to turn people off, my entire job is basically to uh, teach people about CMMC, NIST 800-171, explain what the DOD means with all their acronyms and word salad regulations. They're not very good at explaining what they're talking about or connecting dots. And that 10 to 20% of analysis that they miss on providing to the public is an opportunity for Summit 7 to create content. And we call it marketing, but uh, really, and I mean, hopefully, I think you've seen quite a bit of the content uh, we really just try to uh, teach people what's going on with the regulation. Uh, our sort of belief is that it becomes an inevitability where if you understand what the regulations are asking for specifically and what they mean, that you will likely end up going with Summit 7 as a provider because of our deep collective expertise, not mine specifically, but our deep collective expertise on how to manage and navigate those regulations and requirements. So uh, it's a weird title, but it is as interdisciplinary and uh, open-ended as it sounds. So um, it's a little, it's kind of all three of those things, which, I mean, if you're interested in how I got there, uh, I was on active duty in the military for eight years where I did a whole host of different cybersecurity missions. Uh, about half of that time was spent at the National Security Agency, which was very, very interesting and super cool work. Uh, but the Navy, you know, uh, being the Navy says you got to rotate every once in a while. So I ended up going and doing some cyber defense work out of San Diego, which was a really terrible place to be stationed. And then once I got out of the military, I worked as a SOC analyst as a, you know, shift work 
SOC watch floor standard cybersecurity type job. And uh, just through the, uh, you know, to and fro randomness of, you know, what everybody experiences in any career, I had the opportunity to then go work in the world of DOD acquisitions, which uh, is not exciting at all, which is, uh, which was actually very interesting, though, because a lot of the problems that we end up with that we read about in the news about weapon systems being hacked and data being exfiltrated and all of those things actually start years and years before those events actually occur. And the decisions that are made in the acquisition world influence the data breaches and uh, cybersecurity attacks that happen years later. But nobody wants to go work in acquisitions because it's boring and it's regulations and it's compliance. And so it doesn't really get looked at. As we've seen, um, that has started to creep out into, um, you know, closer and closer to everybody's day-to-day -day life because the situation started to get worse and worse. So I was able to shift from working at a government program office, doing some specific acquisition works over to working at a large prime contractor called Northrop Grumman, sort of working the opposite side going on to work at a program that's sponsored by NIST, which writes a lot of cybersecurity standards, where I was able to do some consulting directly with several hundred small manufacturers, uh, in, specifically in Southern California, Arizona, Nevada area. And that's when I really started to work directly with NIST 800-171, which people are probably more familiar with, which is uh, now known as a program called CMMC, which evaluates those requirements. And then we were off to the races as that program started to speed up. More and more people were caught by surprise. They didn't know what it meant. They didn't know where it came from. They didn't know what was going on or what was about to happen. And since I had been staring at that problem for several years at that point, I started posting about it. And now we're here on the podcast. Wow. Okay. So there is one thing that, um, if you wouldn't mind to clarify, you said sure. something along the lines of, things happened before or the leaks or breaches happened before. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you mean by that? Sure. So like a good example would be, um, so the, the way that the sort of two sides of the coin here, when I left my duty station at the NSA and went to go work on what I called uh, cyber defense work, we would show up and do the cybersecurity evaluation of the networks that existed on ships because we were Navy blue team operators. So before an aircraft carrier or a destroyer would deploy, we mm -hmm. would show up and do their cybersecurity assessment, much like a DIBCAC auditor or a CMMC C3PAO would show up and do an assessment against CMMC and NIST controls. We had a set of NIST controls to evaluate these networks um, and, and weapon systems. And what ended up happening is when you show up to a ship that has this network that is installed or a system that is installed, there may be inherent design flaws and vulnerabilities in that system that the people on the ship are not able to fix. The program management office back in Virginia or San Diego or somewhere like that is in charge of refreshment and sustainment and all of these big sort of slow moving logistics pieces that would work for everything on the ship, including the technology. And so the decisions that are made in acquisition, maybe five or 10 years prior about the types of technologies that they're gonna buy, the architecture that's going to be used, the nature of the system that's on board the ship gets baked in and sort of the baseline gets snapped shut. So by the time I would show up as a blue team assessor and there are IT folks who are running and maintaining the system, uh, we were unable to fix the problems that existed in the network. So when I, by chance, happened to go all the way back to the beginning into the world of acquisitions through the way that you know, careers start to evolve, I got to see the other side. What we typically hear about in the news is you say, you hear, oh, there was a DOD IG report, or there was a GAO evaluation, or there was some news story that came out about how people can hack the F-35 or the new network on Ford class carrier. And what you have to realize is that the people who are maintaining and securing those networks 
don't actually have the ability to change it fundamentally. It has to be changed through the acquisition process. So in security, there's this common phrase called shift left, which means that you want to make security decisions as early as possible in the design life cycle. If you wait until the end of the life cycle to try and secure things, you may be bolting on technologies. It's very expensive. There may be issues you can't even fix at that point. Very similar to quality, right? You want to do quality as early as possible and throughout the process, because if you wait until something is done, uh, you may not be able to fix it. It's much more expensive. Same concept. Well, the ultimate way of shifting all the way left is going all the way to the very beginning of the decisions. Those decisions happen in acquisitions. So most people, when they think of cybersecurity, they think of like, somebody in a hood in a dark room with like lots sure. of blinky lights, right? Yeah, that's yeah. not, I mean, that that's part of it, but the bigger picture is uh, someone in a, you know, uh, short sleeve shirt and a pocket protector with a tie on working in an acquisition office, making decisions about what's getting bought and what's being designed and what's required is influencing the ability of those people in the hoods to exploit those systems years later. And so it's a much bigger, slower moving world uh, that uh, that is involved here. So, wow. Okay, thank you. Well, I think this is a great time um, for listeners to either pause or if they want to check some stuff out after the podcast. I know you have um, some viral videos on the Summit Seven Systems YouTube channel. Um, so one of those is the fascinating uh, history of CMMC, as told by Jacob Horn. I'll make sure to um, put that link on the screen. And then um, there's another video that is an update, essentially CMMC 2.0 update for the defense industrial base. Are there any other videos or sources listeners yeah, can there's, check out? Um, yeah, yeah, there's a couple that I think we can put in the links. And you know, the YouTube page is a great place to follow uh, what we do. So we do a lot of long form webinars. We do several in person events every year that have you know a dozen or so hour long, uh, very involved talks. We usually post those to the YouTube page. We also take clips from those that are relevant and post them to the YouTube page. You know, the thing about uh, Summit 7 is we are entirely focused on working with DOD contractors on this specific problem. So effectively, all of our content revolves around either explaining, it, the way to think about it is most of what I do is explaining the problem side because there's a lot of people out there, and I'm sure you've seen this happen. There's a lot of people out there investing money or purchasing services, and they don't really understand the nature of the problem they're trying to solve. And so they end up getting caught uh, with uh, unsatisfactory documentation or solutions, or they're not as compliant as they thought they were, or this company told us that all we needed to do was write a check and all the pain would go away. And that is really a function of not understanding the problem. The DOD doesn't explain the problem very well, so it's hard to rely on just taking a look at what DOD says to know what's going on. Getting back to what we said before, that's my whole job here is just to try to bridge that gap between the problem side and the solution side. Um, so a lot of our content is just going over the problem side and clarifying and explaining what's going on. So we have lots of interesting videos. The history of CMMC video is, I mean, it's over an hour long. I highly recommend that people watch it because that entire video was based on the idea that when I was working with NIST and we were interfacing with a lot of small manufacturers, the number one thing that I would hear was, this is all new. What's up with the new requirements? CMMC is new. Like, why, why am I being asked to do new stuff? And the truth is, is it's not new. It's actually quite old. And it isn't until you pull the camera back, like I try to do in that video, when you realize that because it isn't new, it is inevitable. And so a lot of the debate around CMMC is how is it going to change? Or should I do it because it's changing? Or is it really going to happen? And there's all this hesitancy because of the perception that it's new and it's different and it's going away and it's changing. And most of those are completely untrue. That's They're not true at all. It isn't until you zoom out that you realize that um, that this sort of slow moving wheels of acquisition and regulations 
like I said, sort of make it an inevitability. Um, but it, it's very easy to, to get very focused on whatever the newest interview was or the newest uh, sound bite happens to be. You know, there's been a lot of unnecessary confusion, which is 100% the fault of the DOD's inability to clearly explain things. But it's just, um, it's a very unique position to be sitting in because I've been looking at the problem for so long that you see companies sort of convince themselves uh, into a state of paralysis. They're sort of waiting for things to happen. And as I'm sure we can get into later, if you wait, this is the tragic part about the, the, the CMMC regulation here, is if you wait until the day that everything is in black and white, you will be very far behind the curve to catch up with your competitors. Um, and I, you know, I'm sure people are like, oh yeah, you know, this guy sells CMMC services, so I'm sure that's what he's going to say watch the video, right? I mm -hmm. think that the video has plenty of sources and citations to explain that that claim. Great. I know you're really active on LinkedIn. I follow you. I try to keep up with everything. Um, CMMC has a lot of layers and is also heavily debated as you just brought up. Why is this such a heavily debated topic? And then my second question is, is there a philosophy of cybersecurity? Sure. So two big questions, right? Yes. The, yes. <laughs> the number one reason why I think CMMC is such a source of contention goes back to sloppiness on the part of the DOD in explaining what CMMC actually is. Every once in a while, they'll come close to being very clear in their explanation of what it is supposed to be. But because they have not been consistently clear on a regular basis, it has opened up the door for interpretation and myth and all sorts of uh, you know, creative takes on what they really mean. And DOD is not a, they are not marketers. They are not good communicators. They are, they are acquisition professionals. They are government bureaucrats, right? And so communication, not necessarily their strong suit. And I think that that gap between the way that people are used to consuming information in a business environment, especially on a regulatory basis, and the way that DOD is used to communicating with themselves internally have smashed into each other uh, at the intersection of CMMC, and it has made everyone very angry. So the number one concept that I think people should walk away with is that CMMC is an assessment program for an existing set of cybersecurity requirements. The existing set of cybersecurity requirements is contained in a document called NIST Special Publication 800171. It's 110 requirements split into 14 families and categories. We'll link the video that explains all this, but those requirements have existed for years and years. CMMC is a program that the DoD has stood up to attempt to assess people's implementation of those requirements. Why would they do that? Well, there were more and more data breaches. There, were, there was more and more proof that over the years, they were not implementing the requirements the way that they had claimed. And so there was just a mounting wave of evidence until finally Congress directed the DOD to go evaluate defense contractors to say, what the heck is going on around here? We've got all these self-attestations that are saying Oh yeah, we're doing this. We're doing this. We're doing all these all these requirements. But every time we build a jet, kind of China gets a carbon copy of it. Like we know that there that things are not being implemented the way that they're being claimed. So what the heck is going on? We got to go check people's work. So CMMC is not a new set of requirements. It is an assessment program for pre-existing requirements. Problem is, they didn't say that. And so when CMMC came out, you know, basically in writing in 2020, the government said, we're going to come assess you under CMMC. And people said, what the heck is that? This is new. What are these requirements? They even went so far, the DOD did, to take the requirements in 800-171 and relabel them as if they were something new, which I spent 18 months trying to, you know, yell at the top of my lungs, don't do that. If you relabel those requirements, people are going to think that they're they're new and they are identical. Now that has since been corrected in CMMC 2.0, but the damage was already done. People still view it as 
a distinctly separate set of requirements. And it's not, it's just there as a program to evaluate existing requirements. Okay. Do you think that <clears throat> they labeled it as new or why would they do that? Do you think that was to create some kind of urgency to get people to comply or? No, you know? I think it's, I don't even think it's that that advanced. So there's a term that you'll hear in the governance risk and compliance space of cybersecurity called framework sprawl. So there is a lot of cybersecurity frameworks, control frameworks. It seems like there is one for every industry and day of the week. There is the CIS controls. There are controls for uh, the energy uh, sector. There are NIST controls. There are cloud security controls. There are you know these controls and those controls and this framework and that framework. And people say, man, we really hate all of these different frameworks. And this is a much longer topic that we don't have time to get into. All of the controls under the hood are the same. There are only so many ways to describe configuration management. Mm -hmm. There are only so many ways to describe vulnerability management. There are only so many ways to describe patch management and who is an authorized user and so on and so forth. These are fundamental concepts but they get picked up by different regulating bodies, different industries, different this, different that, and they relabel them. They create them as their own thing. And now we end up with dozens of frameworks and who on earth has the time to go through and check to make sure that they're all the same. No one would, except GRC people, would want to go through and see how they're related. So you end up just looking at this landscape of new frameworks. Why did the DOD take an existing standard and relabel it as something new? I, there, I don't know what the reason is, but there is no good reason why they would do that. Because if you were to think ahead as to what that would do, we know that it, this happened. You're just going to confuse people. They had to walk that decision back. Now under CMMC 2.0, remember, they were calling it 2.0 as if it's different from 1.0. It isn't different. It is still NIST 800-171 under the hood. And now if you go read the documentation, it even says in the documentation, this is from 171, this is from one. It's literally a, a wrapper around 800-171 as it should be. It is a program assessing 800-171. It does not change or modify the requirements. So why do they do it? I don't know if anybody knows. They are certainly not alone in the trend of relabeling frameworks because it just seems like every industry and regulating body does this but fundamentally those controls are all the same so as a quick side note 800-171 the pre-existing requirements are not unique to the DOD this is not a, a DOD set of requirements those are a set of requirements that apply to all federal agency contractors uh, regardless and it has to do with the nature of the data that you deal with now, it hasn't caught up to all the other agencies at the time of this conversation. DOD is really the first ones. Ironically, DOD is actually way ahead of the rest of the government. They're, they're moving much faster than the rest of the government, uh, even though it feels like things are moving very slowly. So if DHS or IRS or Department of Commerce wanted to assess their contractors against 800-171, then they would have to come up with a program to assess their implementation. And they don't have to use CMMC because that's DOD's program. Now they could, or they could come up with C triple MC or MMMC or whatever they wanna call it because they have a program to assess the requirements. So we could end up in a situation where we have 14 different kinds of CMMC or we have 14 different agencies using one CMMC, the requirements are different from the assessment programs. Very key concept to remember. One of the questions that we lost 20 minutes ago before my rant was, is there a philosophy of cybersecurity? Is that still, do we still wanna go there? Well, yes, well, I don't know. That's pretty, that's kind of just, that's a per, my own, sure. I, I'm interested in that. But before we go on to that, so it's almost like the DOD is like um, the front, the bird at the front of the V. Can, the canary in the coal Yeah, line. exactly. So they're taking I, all of the hits. I use that metaphor a lot. Okay. It is a very apt metaphor. 
And I think, you know, with philosophy of cybersecurity, it's it's related to, you know, I'm looking at all of this at, from an outside perspective and I'm like, this is such a hot topic, you know, or yeah. and so heavily debated. So that was kind of a part of my reasoning for asking the question, is there a philosophy of cybersecurity? Sure. Well, you know, a, but you we know, don't have big, to go in. We well, don't it's a big question, in. right? Philosophy of cybersecurity. I think it might need to be another episode. I don't even really know. I don't really even know what my answer would be as a philosophy of security overall. What I will uh -huh. say is there is a philosophy around security controls that is maybe more relevant to mm -hmm. people who are listening. Yeah. So one of the key debates and the key misconceptions around NIST 171 and CMMC in the manufacturing world for DoD contractors is policy versus functionality. People say, we hate doing the documentation. It's a waste of time. We don't want to do the documentation. We don't want to do policy and procedure. We, we pay a company to do our security. That should be good enough. The fundamental philosophy behind NIST, NIST's approach to security and security controls is that the functionality, the technology in your ecosystem, in your business, in your control environment, exists to enforce management decisions, right? Management has thought about who is authorized to do certain things, who needs privileged access and who doesn't, what types of data need to flow into what parts of the business and why, right? There has been thought put into the nature of the security of your business and the data that you hold, especially if you are holding data from external parties like the federal government and the DOD and large prime contractors and the data has sensitivity attached, much in the same way that companies would need to be concerned with privacy information and protecting its confidentiality. Manufacturers need to be concerned with protecting the confidentiality of sensitive government data. They are very closely related. So yeah. management decisions are captured via policy. That is how they are promulgated. And so if you have controls and technologies, if you're spending your money on security, it should only be there because it's what you want, not because what someone sold you or what your managed service provider told you is a good idea, right? It should be mm -hmm. there because that's what you wanted to be there. And yes. so if, you, if an assessor shows up and you say, well, we have all of this functionality in our ecosystem but we don't have any documented policy or procedure whatsoever, it is an immediate red flag that you wrote a check and you have no idea what's going on. You don't know why it's there. You don't know who's doing what or why. And that just causes everything to snowball out of control. So longer topic, but fundamentally, you should only be spending money on the things that you need. And you mm -hmm. should only be spending money on the things that you want to have in the ecosystem. And the best way to sync those two things together is what are the management decisions about what needs to occur? Are you letting your external service provider like Summit 7 tell you uh, what your management of your business should be? Or are you taking the reins and deciding what needs to happen? That's a longer conversation. Yeah, but well, that's really people, interesting. When people discount policy and procedure, it isn't just a, a paperwork exercise. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it can devolve into that if you let mm -hmm. it, but that's not really the underlying philosophy, if you will, of what the controls are supposed to represent. Well, it's kind of something that kind of just popped into my mind as you were talking. It makes sense that it's unfortunate, but it kind of makes sense that cybersecurity or security in general can kind of get pushed aside because um, in terms of business, because a business sure. can't really brag like, oh, we have, it's a preventative measure. So yeah. it's um, a risk management function. Okay. So it's but, a you risk know, but, management function. Yeah. So with technology, they can be like, we have the latest technology and they can use that to, you mm -hmm. know, increase sales or of course. whatnot, but you can't really use your, well, maybe you can use your cybersecurity. We have the best cybersecurity since, you I know, mean, no one's really talking well, about that. The problem is, is that if you have the best cybersecurity, you're probably more expensive. And that's, that's bad for business.
right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. this is a, um, you know, it's a, it's a fundamental problem. So sort of two things on that topic, which I know we're off script here. I apologize. But... No, that's okay. I, I mean, it's interesting to me. So, so here's the, well, hopefully the audience finds it interesting too, right? So yes, yes. <laughs> the, the, oh, that's the, that's the key part, right? Yeah. So exa exactly what you said about, you know, security, the market doesn't really reward security. I mean, heck yeah. we're debating about CMMC as a government regulation. And one of the main points of contention is everybody goes, hey, DOD, we agree with you. Mm -hmm. Security is a great thing to do, and we should all be better at it, but it mm -hmm. isn't free. And if you want everybody to have better security, costs are going to go up. What do you want to do about that? Do right. you want us to eat the cost? Are you going to reimburse us for the cost? Do we just bill you directly for the cost? Do we roll it? How do you want us to deal with the cost? Mm -hmm. Now, that is a, you talked about the canary in the coal mine. That is a microcosm of the problem of security broadly. For the economic aspect of running a business, you will never spend enough money to be fully secure, whatever that even means, because eventually spending one more dollar on security won't get you a return. It's already hard enough to calculate the return on your money for a security investment, right? Mm -hmm. In economics, this is what's known as a market failure. The market does not adequately reward companies for going all the way, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when, and that's, that's fine. There's lots of things that are market failures. There's lots of things we should do that the market doesn't necessarily reward. The problem is, is that we should still do them. And there are very few options for how to make people do them when the market does not make them. There's really only three options. One is to tax market failures. The other is to subsidize market failures. And the last one is to regulate market failures. And we aren't gonna be taxing bad security anytime soon. Clearly, we're not gonna be subsidizing security in a meaningful way anytime soon. And so we're left with what we originally started talking about, regulation. We mm -hmm. are going to regulate cybersecurity. And CMMC is not unique here. Go look at the insurance industry, go look at SEC rulemaking, go look at congressional testimony with CISA and DHS. It is nonstop debate around who's regulating who and why and how quickly and how much regulation can we put out there because everyone has realized that the market will not reward and police this problem by itself. The issue with regulation is that it is very slow. It's very reactive and it's very imprecise and it's written by the government and it's not very clear and it's super complicated, but it's really one of the only options that the government has to try to force the system to self-correct. And, you know, as we were talking before we started recording, that suddenly makes the world of compliance and governance and risk management one of the most important aspects of cybersecurity because really the thing that ties the world of business and the world of security together is the forcing function of regulations. And in my perspective, uh, on, a, on a long enough timeline, everything is getting regulated. I mean, you can't throw a dart at a random topic out there and it's not being regulated from a cybersecurity perspective or about to be. So um, CMMC, like we said, is just a sneak preview of what's coming around mm -hmm. the corner, regardless of what industry or vertical you're in. There's a lot of people who say, oh, we only do a little bit of DOD work and we don't wanna deal with these regulations. So we're not gonna do DOD work anymore. Okay but you can't run forever and it's, 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 it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here it it's comes. really, you know, it's terrible because, you know, you say this and it makes sense, but if you say it too much or if you say it too loudly, then you're like, well, you're just scaring people, right? It's just fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You're just, you're peddling FUD. And my answer to that is go watch the video, yeah. go read the news. Yeah. And it's only <laughs> FUD if it's not true. Right. We uh, need this. <laughs> yeah, it, we need it. It's going to happen. It's it's inevitable that it's going to happen. Now, that being said, it doesn't necessarily have to be that complicated, right? Mm -hmm. But if you wait for the government to explain it in a way that makes it seem less complicated, you're going to be very disappointed because they can't explain their way out of a paper bag. They can regulate you, but they aren't necessarily the ones that are going to teach you what they meant, mm -hmm. right? And that, that obviously 
puts people in a difficult position because then I, I work for a company that mm-hmm. sells services and I mm-hmm. say, oh, you should trust what I say, right? And that obvious people should take that with a grain of salt because we're, it, this is a business exchange like anything else. But that's why I think Summit 7 was so forward thinking and they said, listen, you don't work for sales. I don't have a sales quota. I'm just out there to have conversations like this because there's a lot of companies that lock those that information and those explanations behind paid subscriptions or only once you pay for the service. Uh, and that's just that's just not a good way, I think, to bring people around to the idea of security, right? You should give that information away for free. And then hopefully they say, these people are honest brokers, so we should learn more about their services from there. I see. Okay. Well, I feel like um, organically, you know, the next question is why is all of this so important? But I yeah. think you sort of touched upon that when you were talking about, you know, from the management perspective, like what they need. Is sure. there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, it's important. It's important because we're losing the war. That's the bottom line. I mean, does does anybody when they wake up in the morning, I'm sure no one listening to this wakes up and thinks about cybersecurity first thing please don't right? there's other things to think about <laughs> you do <But> some <laughs> i do i do right yeah. but sometime during the day or during the week just ask yourself do you feel like cybersecurity is getting better right the answer is absolutely not it is getting worse day by day mm-hmm. and so like we said the market does not reward it regulation is really one of the only options and as we have kicked over more rocks and more industry analysis has come out and more IG reports have been conducted on contractors and the more that Congress has looked into it and over here and over there, it is very obvious that things are not going well. People aren't implementing controls. The attacks are getting worse. We don't know where the data is going. Things are, things are spiraling at an accelerating rate. And so as a result, we're going to see these forcing functions come by. Now, I wish it were not so adversarial, but at the end of the day, regulations are regulations. And at the time of this recording, about a, about a month from now, I'll actually be giving a talk on that specific topic. So part of regulations is the creation of regulations, which is a process known as rulemaking. So in the government, regulations are known as rules. And the rulemaking process involves public comments that are submitted to proposed regulations. And the government, by law, has to consider all comments that are submitted and then give a response when they finally issue the regulation. Now, like I said before, these requirements are not new. So we have seen this actually in various forms of rulemaking and regulations uh, over the last decade and various comments from the public on this same topic related to CMMC, but under a different name, have been submitted in the past. So a lot of companies are waiting until the rule comes out to see what the government will say about certain things. So I, crazily enough, went through and read all 850 comments that were submitted to the government on the regulation, and it falls into the same set of patterns that we've seen in the past. It's too costly. It's too burdensome. Regulations create barriers to entry. They are more harmful to small businesses on balance compared to large businesses. That is the nature of what, that is the trade-off of what a regulation does. It forces action, but it has negative side effects. And so everybody is basically in a staring contest with the DOD saying, did you know that if you regulate an industry, it does these four or five bad things? And the DOD clearly does know that that's what happens because the government regulates people. That's what regulations do. There's trade-offs to everything, right? There's no, there is no real perfect solution in any way. And it's just very interesting to go through. Well, let me stop and stop there. It's probably not interesting for the average person to read all these comments, but we're going to release a video where I summarize the comments and you don't have to go read them. When is the presentation? Uh, It's at the end of July, July 26th and 27th. We have a big, we also have a hybrid event. I don't know if this is actually going to come out before then, uh, but we have a hybrid event for registration if you can't make it to Washington, D.C. in person. Uh, And it's not just me speaking for two days, as entertaining as I'm sure that would be for most people. Uh, There's people from the government, there's people from DOD, there's people from U.S. Cyber Command, there's folks from NIST, uh, as well as speakers who are industry analysts, folks like myself. 
uh, sort of adding color commentary to what the government is going to put out. And it's sort of their big summer update around what's going on with CMMC, the future of NIST controls, their philosophy, if you mm-hmm. will, about mm-hmm. the way that they're going to evolve and expand over time. Okay. So sort of the big shindig before everybody goes away, DC usually shuts down in August. So that's why we tried to get everybody on stage at the end of July. So is there a link where people can um, yep. learn yeah, more we'll about give that? You the, yep, we'll give you the link. And okay. um Registration at this time is still open. And, you know, like I said, if you can't make it for whatever reason, you know, over time, those clips and videos will eventually filter their way out. But if you want it straight from the fire hose, uh, the July 26th and 27th is the best time to, to find that information. Okay, great. For you personally and professionally, because I know I can tell that you're very passionate about your work. So why does this matter to you so much? You know, it's interesting, right? I mean, I have a very unique perspective in the sense that um, I started I started within the depths of the National Security Agency as a young man in the military, right? So I got to see a very unique perspective on the geopolitical situation through the lens of cybersecurity between nation states sort of duking it out on in cyberspace. Right. I mean, this is sort of where wars are fought now. The current sort of cold war that the world is in is really run and dominated through economic warfare and cyberspace. Right. The chances that you and I are going to be in trenches somewhere uh, dug into the ground are pretty small. It's really sort of this what they call a gray war. Right. There's this sort of shadow war that happens between nation states and it's not highly regulated. It's not really governed by international law all that well. The lawyers can't really figure out what the rules are. And so it's kind of the Wild West, especially, you know, 15, 20 years ago when I was at at NSA. Um, So whenever I worked my way through, you know, all of the various positions that I worked in, and I ended up working with small manufacturers downstream from DOD weapon systems programs, right? It was the opposite side of the coin from where I started at NSA. And it was, frankly, it was horrifying because if you walk into uh, the average sort of DOD contractor manufacturing environment, Mm -hmm. you can tell that everybody in there loves what they do. I mean, I've worked with companies that make all manner of components uh, on all manner of weapon systems and almost to a company, when you walk in, they are very proud of what they do. They are patriotic, flag-waving Americans who know that they do very important stuff and they do it super well and they're the best at it. Mm-hmm. And almost to a company, they have no idea what to do when it comes to cybersecurity and for the, the idea that they would be working so hard on making these parts and supporting the warfighter and making cool weapon systems and just doing what they do, mm-hmm. but that we would then sort of freely hand away that information uh, doesn't sit well with them. It doesn't sit mm-hmm. well with the DoD. Nobody likes that idea. Yeah. And the problem is, is that you then get into a situation where the DOD's only real option is to try to regulate people. And they do it in a very sort of uh, disconnected and cold way, right? They don't communicate very well. There doesn't seem to be a lot of empathy. Uh, There's just not a lot of good perspective taking. I'm very certain that a lot of the folks in DOD, as hardworking and well-meaning as they are, probably haven't spent a lot of time in a small manufacturing environment, right? A 25 Mm. person company. They just, it's just not what they do. And this disconnect is very, it's tragic, right? It's, it's really terrible. And so I just by happenstance ended up in the middle of that conversation. And because of that perspective, I feel like I am able to try and help that conversation connect to those two sides. So you'll notice in a lot of the stuff I post on LinkedIn, Um, sometimes people will feel like I'm sort of taking a shot at the industrial base, like sort of taking a shot at small businesses and other days it'll feel like I'm taking a shot at the government and sort of blaming them. It's not a question of who to blame, right? There's plenty of blame to go around, uh, but we're, we're going to have to sort of clarify and explain the nature of these problems before we can reach a solution. Like we talked about earlier, there's people out there who think, 
I have a systemic problem within my business where I have poor security. I don't have enough money. I don't have a full understanding of the regulations or what these controls even mean. So I'm going to go out and just buy a solution. That is not a recipe for success. That's not a recipe to end up with less regulation. It's not a way to pass an assessment. It's not a way to be secure. It's, it's a Band-Aid. And so it's this strange you know, developing environment where, you know, I just feel passionate about it because um, people need help, yeah. right? The government needs help explaining things. People need help understanding what the heck the government is saying. And then you have to somehow tie that into the weird, complicated, spooky world of cybersecurity. So it's, it's exhausting, but it's very interesting in terms of just trying to add coherence to that conversation, which is what I try to do. So right. it's just a, it's just an interesting problem. Well, it sounds to me like there are multiple layers of disconnects, kind of. Oh, yeah. And would you say that kind of leading into our next question, another disconnect is we have this problem because technology has rapidly advanced and our systems for protecting sensitive data fell behind? Um, yes and no. So you're correct. There are multiple points of disconnection in the sense that this is a complex problem, meaning that there is no like one thing that's broken in the system. Like there's right. no, there isn't like one gear where yeah. if we replace that gear, the whole thing works. Right. It is a, it's a complex problem, meaning, uh, yeah, we, we try to fix this and then something else happens. Then we try to fix that. And then there's some other byproduct, right? Right. So there is no like one for one solution problem right yeah so, there is no like cyber security superhero yeah, yeah absolutely not yeah it's gonna come not. in and it's be a, like it's, a, it's, right. a, it's a, yeah it's a systemic problem right in the sense mm -hmm. that there is a problem in the way the system works so the acquisition system the data flow environments all sorts of things like that it's it's a first of all right the thing that is it's a complex problem and regulation inherently is tries to be as simple as possible, right? So that's already going to cause issues. You're going to try to make a simple solution to a complex problem, which is probably going to cause more issues. And we're seeing that with CMMC. Everybody agrees on the premise. It is, despite the government's best attempts, it's relatively simple and it's causing unintended issues that we're going to then have to deal with from there. So your question about whether technology is outpacing the ability to stay secure, yes and no. So technology, yes, is, is advancing very rapidly, and that has the byproduct of causing vulnerabilities and the ability to exploit those vulnerabilities to advance at you know exponential rate as technology changes. However, like we talked about earlier, cybersecurity is getting worse overall. And it is getting worse oftentimes in sectors that have near unlimited budgets and very advanced technology for cybersecurity. It is clear, I think, that cybersecurity is not a technology problem, right? It is an element of, of a technology problem, but most business environments, you know, or sorry, most manufacturing environments don't really have technology that changes on a super, super fast basis compared to financial services or very high-tech software only cloud native companies. I mean, you have technology that changes, but there's it's it's a slower process of change. So it can't just be that their technology environments are changing so quickly that they can't keep up. The process of knowing what data you have and what regulations that you are under and what that means and what you can and can't do and, and sort of how that is translated into your environment isn't really a technology function. The sort of world of governance, risk, and compliance isn't really a technology aspect. It's more of the interface between your business environment and the world of technology. So we can see this with the world of CMMC. People will say, oh, the government or large prime contractors should pay for cloud computing enclaves where people can do all of their work, right? Well, can you move your CNC machine into the cloud, right? Can you move your entire manufacturing line into a cloud environment? Can all of your data flows be contained in that one government-sponsored or prime-sponsored cloud environment if it were even to exist? Typically, they cannot, right? That is a simple 
solution being proposed for a complex problem. It is almost the mirror of the regulatory problem. We have, we have simple regulations being proposed for fixing a complex problem. And everybody goes, well, cloud enclaves. Don't get me wrong. Summit 7 sells cloud enclaves, right? Like my ability to keep these lights on is because we sell cloud enclaves. They are not a silver bullet. It, it, you cannot fix all of your problems with technology alone. Even the majority of the requirements in 800-171 are not necessarily about technology specific issues. It's about the management of those technologies, the understanding of who has access to them and why, the data flows and why, the management decisions, the overall philosophy that we talked about earlier, right? That's, that's the part that technology can't fix for you but it takes a lot of time and effort to think about those things and correct them. There's a term that we use called organizational and technical debts. So you have technical debts, like you have outdated operating systems that aren't supported anymore, like Windows XP, or you've got uh, computer systems that run manufacturing equipment that can no longer be patched or supported. That's technical debt, right? Those are things that you need to refresh on an ongoing basis that you should because outdated technology generally is easier to export. But you also have organizational debt, right? What regulations do we have? If you think to, in manufacturing, if you think to the quality management system documentation, this would be, you know, all of the, you know, first, the beginning sections of ISO 9001 type documentation, the management of your environment, the, the this management decisions around the environment. You know, what customer property are we dealing with? Imagine if you just didn't do any of that and you said, well, all of our measurements are correct, right? You've got this very tight functionality at the end of it with no, no philosophy governing that, that management system. Same, this happens very often with security because it sort of snuck up on everybody, right? We digitized everything. We plugged everything together and networked it all together. And it wasn't until a regulation came around that we started thinking about well, you know, what does our managed service provider do for us? What does this external company that has access to our equipment under the, uh, under the name of maintenance, what, what, what accesses do they have to our network? And what data do we have in our environment? And what are the rules that govern that data? Those are organizational debts. And that's not really something that a piece of technology can fix for you. My number one question um, was for you initially is like, what's at stake here? I think you sure. touched upon that a little bit, but is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, um, you know, it, it it's a little bit of hyperbole when people are like, we're losing the war and, you know, China is getting these jets. And I think the more that people learn about security, the more that you'll learn that the line between hyperbole and reality is very thin. Um, you know, I used to joke all the time that when I would work directly with small manufacturers, if I walked in the door and I said, your inability to pay attention to your technical and organizational debts means your grandchildren are going to be speaking Mandarin, typically <laughs> meant that they were going to call the cops. They're like, this guy's crazy. Like, what are right. you talking about? Uh, however, right, when you zoom out and you look at the sort of macro trends of what's going on, if every single company in the industrial base thinks they're not a target, doesn't pay attention to their data flows, and it doesn't really matter, then we have a larger collective issue, right, than what you might think is relevant to your business. This gets back to the idea of a market failure, right? Right. If right. you have a business that is working in their own self-interest of what is good for their business, collectively, that might not be the best for what we need for those data protections on a large scale. So, you know, what's at stake from a tangible, from the audience's perspective, what's at stake is your ability to work with your customers, period. It's the, your ability to get cyber insurance, which likely will be a hard requirement in the future. Uh, it's your ability to work with large publicly traded corporations like Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, because the Security and Exchange Commission is saying that their supply chain risk management is a materially reportable item to their investors and to the government. So you could get regulated by de facto that way. It is maybe directly from a DOD regulation like CMMC for existing requirements that have already existed for years. The walls are closing in on everybody like we mentioned earlier because security touches everything. And if you are in a supply chain anywhere, 
then it affects you because it affects your customers, whether you agree with it or not. And so, uh, yeah, we can go into the bigger spectrum of how China is eclipsing the United States in many ways. And this is a contributing factor, allowing them to eclipse us more quickly. It's not the only thing, right? It's not the only reason why the, the power dynamics on a global scale are changing. It's not just because you don't have a good patch management program, but it's also not, not because you don't have a good patch management program, right? You have to zoom out and realize that, sorry, this, this happens a lot where, like you said, everyone will agree, oh, everything's connected nowadays, right? Everything is internetworked, right? Everything is connected and it, technology touches everything and it's e increasing at a, a faster and faster rate. And then they go, yep, that's true. I agree with you. And you'd say, do you think that because of that heavy interconnectivity and interdependence that your security posture might mean something in the bigger picture of what's going on? They go, no, 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 no. We're too small to be a target. And you go, well... I don't know how to tell you that if you agree with the first part, then the second part is the part that comes along with it, right? You don't get to pick one or the other. They, they are a package deal. Wow. Okay. That was some gold. How do you anticipate? I think we already talked about this a little bit too, but you've said things will change over the next couple mm -hmm. of years. So um, how much of that is like speculation and how much of that is like fact? Like we know that we are going to have to comply or such and such. So I think that the, the overall overarching theme that we'll see over the next several years moving forward is that regulations will become stricter. The number of requirements that you have to deal with will become larger and the ability to undergo an assessment will become more and more important. So one of the main bottlenecks and constraints right now is not around the validity of the requirements. It's not around your ability or inability to comply. The main constraint is strictly on the ability for other people to have the resources to come verify your implementations. We don't have enough assessors. It's too much of a manual process. It's too paperwork based. Those are the kinds of things that get solved by technology, right? If the government could press a button and they had the ability to automatically assess you rather than having to send out a team in person, they would absolutely do it. And if you think that they're not trying to come up with a way to facilitate that assessment process, you're wrong. And so if the government and the SEC and large prime contractors and everybody, insurance companies, figure out a way, as they are actively trying to do, to speed up those assessments, you're still going to have to answer those questions that you have to answer in person manually right now, but in a faster, probably more often process that would occur uh, over time. Now, 800-171 as an example is a very narrow standard. It is not designed to be a holistic cybersecurity program. It is designed to protect the confidentiality of a very specific type of data. There's a bigger aspect to cybersecurity beyond just confidentiality. And we'll give a link to one of those videos that explains this. So as a result, uh, 171 is the requirement and CMMC is the program that assesses the requirement. As technology changes, threats change. As technology changes, technical and organizational debts change. That means that the requirements that you need to provide assurances against will also change. And so as a result, 171 as it currently exists is very lopsided. And in order to make it less lopsided and more of a holistic approach to security, it necessarily has to get bigger. It has to include other requirements within it that come from the catalog of NIST controls. So if you think about that, that's a huge problem because NIST 800-171 is already extremely burdensome for most companies. Uh, it is expensive, it's difficult to understand, and it's really out of reach for a lot of companies that don't seek external help. And we know that it's going to slowly but surely expand over time. So if you're already being crushed by 801 and CMMC, if you expect, based off everything that we've talked about, that the regulations will get less stringent and the control requirements will be fewer in the future, uh, you are deluding yourself, right? 
it is uh, it, that is just not the way that things are are panning out, which like we talked about, NIST will be up on stage in July and they're going to explain some of this and I'll have more content coming out on it in the future. But just sit back, right? Think about what you're seeing in the news. Think about what's going on with regulations and ask yourself, based off of what's going on, right? Everyone listening to this podcast is an intelligent person. Do you think that there is a future where there are less cybersecurity regulations and fewer requirements based off what's going on? without even getting into the specifics of CMMC, that is just not true. Okay, so over half of Assembly's audience is in management at Assembly plants. I'm pretty sure that's actually 60%. So um, as everything continues to evolve, how can plants stay ahead? So, you know, the, given the fact that the majority of manufacturers in the United States tend to be smaller rather than larger, which is you know, true of most businesses, it is an unfortunate reality that most small businesses are just behind the curve with their ability to keep up with cybersecurity because they are small. They don't have the workforce, they don't have the budgets, they don't have, you know, the, they don't have the manpower of a company the size of Bank of America or, or a company like that to, to just sort of deal with security. So you're already starting shorthanded. Now, your ability to understand the requirements is one thing your ability to then deal with the requirements is another. Almost always these problems with dealing with the cloud and dealing with regulations and dealing with the ongoing management of your technical and organizational debts are things that you're going to have to outsource to a managed service provider. Like I said, Summit 7 is one of those companies. This is the, that we make a living just dealing with DIB manufacturers, right? So the key to success is partnering with a company that understands what's going on. What we see a lot of is that small manufacturers have external IT service providers, managed service providers, and those managed service providers maybe sometimes deal with HIPAA, the healthcare information regulation that exists. And they go, well, HIPAA is you know, a regulation, CMMC is a regulation, how different could they be? You know, We help clients with one, we can help you with the other. It is not that simple, right? So the key is to work with a external service provider that understands what's going on. And if you talk to your external service provider and they say, yeah, we understand what's going on, we got it, just verify what that means. Because I will tell everybody that within the world of managed service providers, very few of them are oriented to security and very few of them are oriented to security and compliance the nature of the external IT services industry is designed to manage as many companies as possible with as much margin as possible, trying to do basically as little work as possible through automating everything, just trying to be your outsourced IT department. Uh, like we said before, this is not a technology problem, which means if you are outsourcing your services to a technology company, then there's a very good chance that they don't have a understanding of the problem that they should have, just like you know, a normal company, like we talked about before, may not have a good understanding of the problem. So the number one way to evaluate, sort of to do the smell test, is by asking those companies how familiar they are with a document called NIST SP 800-171A. This is explained in one of the videos that we'll link here, is the relationship between 171 and 171A is critically important. It is as important to understand 171 and 171A as it is to understand the difference between 171 and CMMC. Requirements and the program that assesses those requirements, 171 is the requirements, 171A is the assessment procedures. 171A answers the questions, how do you know that a control is fully implemented, right? You only get credit for a control that is fully implemented. And what typically happens is people read 800-171, they read CMMC, and they go, what the heck does that mean? This is such an open-ended, nebulous requirement. I don't understand what they want. Like, how do I know that I did it correctly? Well, the answer is in 171A. And just like we talked about at the beginning, the government doesn't really tell you that. They don't really explain to you the relationship between 171 and 171A. 
the center of gravity behind this entire conversation is contained in 171A. So for instance, there's 110 requirements in 171. In order to verify that they are actually implemented, there are 320 questions that you should be able to answer confidently in 171A. So if you have a managed service provider, if you have a technology provider, if you have a consulting firm, if you have anybody that is claiming to be able to help you with 800 the number one thing that you should ask them is, how do you deal with 171A? And they should be able to tell you immediately, we understand what it means, here's what we map to, here's what we support. There should be a, a laundry list of things that they should explain to you that should give you the warm and Green flags that these people know what's going on. If they go, what's that? Or- uh, right. that, or CMMC is not one set. If you get any, if you get any pushback whatsoever, and it makes you feel suspicious, you're probably correct, right? Yeah. Everything should orient around 171A. We have it explained in the videos. It is the number one thing that will make your life more simple in terms of, because I mean, let's, let's be, let's be real here. Most companies are not implementing the technologies to support these requirements. They're paying somebody else to do it. So how do you know that you're not getting a lemon? How do you know that the claims that they're selling you are true? If you wait until assessment day to find out that your managed service provider sold you a load of crap, mm -hmm. you're going to be in a really bad position because mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to get those data flows and those contracts from the government anymore. And you're going to have to go sue your man. It's a, it's a huge mess. Right. It's a huge mess. It reminds me of, I was listening to a podcast you were on and you said something along the lines of, in this world, you don't know that something is missing or until something goes wrong, you don't know mm -hmm. that like things were in place or something like that. I can't remember what you said exactly. Yeah, it's a, uh, so, you know, back to the, the you know, uh, obscure world of economic metaphors. So you ever hear of a car where it's called, be you're buying a lemon, right? You yes. don't know, you don't know the car is bad until after you buy it. It so looks it, good. It looks fine. You kick the tires, it starts, you're like, it's mm -hmm. fine, right? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. a lot of states have lemon laws where if your car explodes shortly after you buy it, it's not your fault, right? You got sold a lemon, right? There's there's some responsibility here on behalf of the people selling you this product. And one of the ways that economists have, have described the world of cybersecurity is that it, it is a market for lemons. Because when I say my company is secure, what does that mean? If you have a company and I have a company and you spend a million dollars on security and I spend zero dollars on security and over the course of a year, neither of us get hacked, are you more secure than I am? How do you know, right? You don't. And this is why companies will never spend enough money to be fully secure because you'll never know when you are outside of lemon territory. And this is, this is part of the reason why assessments are actually very valuable. They feel annoying because they're regulated and people are coming to assess you. But the reason why assessments should be valuable internally is how do you know, Mr. or Mrs. Business Owner, that this technology that you bought or this service provider that you're paying on a monthly basis, typically a lot of money, is doing what you want them to do? That is what NIST 800-171A attempts to answer. It really attempts to answer three things. Are the controls implemented correctly? Are they producing the desired outcomes? And are they operating the way that you intended them to? If you just guess and they say, we do CMMC, hit five grand a month. We do CMMC and you'll be good in two days. We do CMMC and it's $28, five easy payments of 28 what is we don't know what any of that means right? red flags so, red flags <laughs> the should... number one way yeah i don't yeah. have a Can way we to just, do it we'll have a yeah, lot of exactly. animated red flags <laughs> yeah, if you exactly. hear any of that nonsense it sounds uh -huh. great i don't but it is not what you should make your decision off of you okay should ask them what does 171a mean if you want more information we have the video i'm also very easy to find find me on linkedin Great. It's very easy to get a hold of Summit 7. And I, I literally talk about this stuff all day long. I will explain 800-171A to anyone who wants to listen. Jacob, I think that seems like a really um, good place to close. Is there anything, my last question was a piece of advice. I feel like you covered a lot just now. Is there anything that you would like to add before we wrap up today? 
Uh, yeah, just on the note about 171A, if you look if you look hard enough, the goal of 800-171A is shared by the assessors and by the business owners, right? The irony here is that the assurances that the government is looking for are the same things that you are looking for when you're spending your money on cybersecurity. And ironically, the questions that you should use to figure out if you're being ripped off or not are the same questions that the government is going to come ask you to figure out if they're being ripped off or not. So if you sort of change your perspective on the questions that the regulators are asking you, you can, you can kill two birds with one stone here, not experience any surprises on assessment day, and also be much more confident that your money is being spent on the things that you need to spend it on. Wonderful. Well, I know, you know, when I called you a guru and an expert in the beginning, <laughs> <laughs> but I, you were a little bit, you know, hesitant about that, but I feel like it's true. I mean, Whoa. you know, we just spoke, <laughs> it was a wonderful experience. You just spoke for a long time. I really appreciate your time today. It was certainly valuable for me and I hope that everyone really enjoys what we recorded. So thank you so much. Thank you. This is a great opportunity. Thank you. Awesome. For more insights on assembling discrete parts into finished products and the people behind it all, visit our website, assemblymag.com. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast to keep up with our latest episodes. We're also on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. So we invite you to follow us there too. This has been Assembly Audible. Thanks for listening.